Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much for coming to this special guest lecture. Uh, so to have today we have Malte Kuhler from uh, Jülich in Germany. Uh, Malte did uh, his uh, undergrad in engineering in with CSP, Farnover, and that already was on PV. And then I think that it was uh, science of engineering in an ad master. Yeah, it was kind of. Yeah, and from 2016 a PhD in uh, Jülich and he's almost finished his PhD and we saw that it will be a good idea to uh, have him here sharing with us uh, some of his published <laughs> work and some of his <coughs> unpublished work. So you are the first one to hear the <laughs> knowledge. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you for inviting. Please <laughs> Yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I will present today some work I did during my PhD in Jülich. And um, yeah, so it will be about, the title is Conducting, Passivating and Transparent um, Development of a Silicon Oxide Silicon Carbide Front Contact for Crystalline Silicon Solar Cells. And um, conducting and passivating um, contacts are out there, so we know a lot of them. Um, for example, morphosilicon heterodunctions or um, silicon oxide polysilicon contacts reached recently really, really good results uh, concerning passivation and conduction. However, these materials are silicon based with a low, kind of low band gap, so they tend to absorb parts of the incident light when they put on the front side of solar cells. Um, that's why um, we thought about it's maybe a good idea to develop a transparent version for a front contact. And so we sticked with um, white band gap materials, actually. So silicon carbide is a white band gap material, which then in the end will um, have the ability to transfer more light into the solar cell. Um, yeah, and the silicon oxide we need it as a buffer layer. OK, so my PhD kind of worked ar around these, um, this triangle. So <coughs> transparency for a silicon carbide kind of comes natural um, because of the high band gap. And um, you can see here um, the extinction coefficient for silicon carbide is all of a magnitude lower than that of crystalline silicon and that of amorphous silicon. Um, additionally, also the refractive index is a really good match for silicon. So also the reflection is lower. And in this way, um, which is our recent study, um, we investigated the microcrystalline silicon carbide as a coating for, um, and as an anti-reflection coating for IBC solar cells. So um, even in a stack with silicon nitride and magnesium fluoride, which will further reduce the um, reflection due to the refractive index grading, um, we found that we have the ability to have really, really high JSCs in IBC solar cells. Um, so since transparency kind of is given for this stack, um, we kind of worked along passivation and conductivity. And um, the device in the end looks like this. We have um, a crystalline silicon N layer, uh, N wafer, which is wet chemically uh, cleaned. And then we prepare a silicon tunnel oxide on top. This is necessary because when we directly apply the um, silicon carbide, to the interface or to the silicon wafer. We destroy the interface due to this hot wire CVD deposition, which is kind of harmful due to a lot of hydrogen radicals, which are um, yeah, introduced during the process. So we also tried amorphous silicon as a buffer layer, but this is, of course, has a lower um, band gap and also is etched away, so it's not a protective layer. So we need the silicon tunnel oxide for um, this silicon carbide deposition. And afterwards, we deposit the silicon carbide by hot wire CVD, since this is not one of the most common tools. I took a picture here. Um, so this is actually the chamber in operation. We have three curled wires, which are um, heated to 1,600 to 2,100 degrees. And from the bottom, you see um, there's an inlet plate for the precursors, and we actually use monomethylsilane. Um, for the silicon carbide, um, hydrogen for dilution. This is why where this uh, hydrogen radicals mostly originate from, and nitrogen as doping. And these uh, precursors decompose close or at the hot wire surfaces, 
That's why it's also called catalytic CVD. And then form the layer of silicon carbide on the top-down substrate, which is um, in the upper part of this image. Um, even though the temperature of the filaments is quite high, um, we have a low substrate temperature because the substrate is heated to only 250 deg degrees, so it still be a low uh, temperature contact here. After the silicon carbide, um, we fabricate the backside. We have a amorphous silicon heterojunction baseline in Jülich, so that's kind of uh, the way we, we go um, here. But it's also possible to use any kind of other um, backside junction in this case. Um, yeah, so we need to do an HF dip first to remove the silicon oxide from the backside, then deposit PCVD uh, amorphous silicon. Then we sputter TCO on both sides and finalize with metallization. Um, yeah, so the great advantages of this contact is we have no uh, post-deposition treatments necessary. So in the S-deposited state, silicon carbide is very well passivating. So we need no high temperature recrystallization as for polysilicon or any additional hydrogenation uh, layers which have to be removed in the end. So the process flow is very, very lean. That's why we believe um, yeah, it might have a future. So um, also this slide should give a small outline of the talk. So in the first couple of minutes I want to talk about wet chemical oxidation because this is the first critical step for this um, uh, contact to work. Then hot wire CVD and development of silicon carbide and then uh, sputtering of TCO since we found that also this is very critical to our contact. With wet chemical oxidation we did a that was the first year of my PhD. We did a large study about wet chemical oxidation. This is what we focused on. We did uh, we searched for a lot of uh, oxidation solutions, and we came up with the three. We basically investigated, and um, standard clean two is HCl and H2O2, which forms an oxide of approximately 0.5 nanometers, which is measured with spectral ellipsometry. Then piranha oxide was a sulfuric acid with H2O2. Um, which forms one nanometer approximately ox oxide thickness, and then we have HNO3, which is the thickest oxide. In our case, we use room temperature HNO3 um, because boiling HNO3 just gave similar results, so um, we stick to the room temperature and the more safer version. Um, and then we found that actually the filament temperature of these hot wires we're using has a strong impact on the passivation. And not only on the passivation itself, but also it depends on how which oxide you use. So this SC2 oxide, the thinnest oxide, is not stable against the process for higher filament temperatures. So probably it's really etched away, and then we damage the surface. But also the thicker oxide um, uh, formed by HNO3 is um, somehow damaged and not uh, resilient, has no high resilience against this process. So we found that actually piranha oxide has the highest stability, even though it's not the thickest one. So we're still investigating um, what's the decisive parameter for oxide stability here. Can be the stoichiometry or the, the density of the oxide. So we are actually looking into this at the moment. So at the end, we decided we go with uh, piranha oxide um, because it just gave the highest IVOCs in this study. Furthermore, we also saw that the contact resistivity decreases. Um, even though the oxide, the thinnest oxide, has the highest um, contact resistivity, so it seems to be that the filament temperature also has a large influence on the um, contact resistivity rather than the thick thickness of the oxide. Besides, for the HNO3, all the points which are not shown here were non-omic, uh, show non-omic behavior, and couldn't be evaluated due to this. So the questions which arise was. Um, what happens with the silicon carbide here? So what happens when we change the filament temperature? And um, we have on the one side, we want to have a filament temperature around 1800 to have a high VOC. But on the other hand, we want to have a really high filament temperatures to have a low contact resistivity. So can we somehow break this trade-off um, or this conflict of interest? So this will be the focus of the next few slides. Um, First of all, we did a second study um, on the IVOC, 
and the filament temperature with newer, um, more quali higher quality wafers. So we reached uh, 740 millivolts, so we were in IVOC, so we were really happy with these results. And um, yeah, still we found that uh, the passivation is dropping for higher filament temperatures. So actually we know with higher filament temperatures we exponentially increase the number of hydrogen radicals in the chamber. So a lot of more etching of the, the oxide probably. So that will introduce more silicon dangling bonds. Furthermore, we found that um, the hydrogen um, the hydrogen concentration in the layer, in the silicon carbide, is reduced by higher filament temperatures. So there is additionally less hydrogen which can passivate these dangling bonds. Plus, due to a higher radiation of the wires, the substrate temperature tends to get higher. So we might also run into an outdiffusion of hydrogen here. So um, these are the three hypotheses we testing at the moment to completely understand this passivation ability um, of the silicon, silica, silicon oxide, silicon carbide contact. Okay, the second question was uh, why is the contact resistivity uh, going down with increased filament temperature? And the answer is kind of simple but interesting. Um, the electrical conductivity is increased during this, in this filament temperature range by about 12 orders of magnitude. So we didn't change anything else, we just, <laughs> just tuned the filament temperature. So that's why internally we sometimes call it the magic material, because we then try to find out um, why is this conductivity so much increased. And we thought, yeah, probably the uh, nitrogen concentration, even though we let the flow constant. And we found actually the nitrogen concentration is indeed increased, but only by 1.5 orders of magnitude. So uh, there are still room for other explanations, I would say. Um, so, yeah, this can't be the whole story. So we try to investigate the crystallite sizes of this microcrystalline silicon carbide. Um, and we tried XRD, but due to the thickness or the thinness of the layers, uh, XRD wasn't uh, successful. However, we found for thicker silicon carbide layers, we have a correlation to FTIR between XRD and FTIR in the crystallite size and um, this linear behavior when we uh, project it onto the, we believe that this is also true for thinner layers, we can measure thinner layers with FTIR and so um, when we assume that this shows that the crystalline size is increased in the same area where also the conductivity is mainly increased and then slightly decreased when the um, electrical conductivity is uh, pretty much stable. So from uh, an earlier PhD thesis from Manuel Pomasca, which is now my day-to-day -day supervisor, um, we know that by increasing the crystallite size, we mainly increase the free carrier density in the material and slightly also the mobility of the material. So however, uh, the question stands, uh, can we break this trade-off between high IVOC and um, contact resistivity? And we came up with the idea to create a double layer stack on top of this oxide. So first we deposit a passivation layer um, with a lower filament temperature to have less hydrogen radicals damaging the surface plus more hydrogen in the material itself to passivate it and then uh, deposit a conductive layer at higher filament temperatures on top. So um, this is the same graph as before, just uh, we included the double layer stack result. So first we deposited this passivation layer at 1775 millivolts um, uh, degree C. Um, since this has the highest passivation quality for single layers and then the filament temperature was increased and then we deposited this double layer stack. And what we can see is that the um, IVOC can be, um, can be constant even though in a single layer case this would uh, mainly drop. In the contact resistivity, we see that the contact res resistivity is not as low as for the best uh, single layer case. However, it's still fairly low. And um, yeah, so we were really happy with these results. And then at the end, in the end, we could say, yes, we can break this trade off. And um, since we now had a huge amount of, so we doubled the layer the layers, so we had to double the effort 
to see what is the influ influence of the temperature, the thickness, and the doping gas flow. So we had a lot of parameters we wanted to test and did a design of experiment to see what is the decisive um, influence, influencing parameter on the efficiency of the solar cell. And um, actually we found that the thickness of the passivation layer has the highest influence. So we did a series of the um, thickness of the passivation layer. And this can be seen here. So what mainly happens, which also makes sense because this is the layer which has low conductivity, the series resistance can be drastically decreased by decreasing um, the thickness from 13 to 3 nanometers. And by that we can clearly increase the uh, fill factor. Um, so that was a, one of the breakthroughs during my PhD thesis. I would say um, here I have to say our measurement system measures the fill factor and the VOC slightly off so that the parameters are slightly too low. So whenever we certify our solar cells with ISFH, they come back better than we, than we measured them. So in the tables, the, the so besides the first one, they certified and the tendency is that they are um, just higher. That's why they don't match exactly the values in the slide here. Um, so Kai Ning, my supervisor, was presenting here last February and also showed my results. So I looked it up in his talk and it was 19.7% uh, with 712 millivolts VOC and a fill factor of 71.5. So we clearly had a fill factor issue. And um, yeah, by using this double layer stack, this could be resolved. So we ended up with 22.3, 22.9% uh, uh, percent efficiency and 80.8% um, fill factor. So this was really a good, good, good increase here just by using this double layer stack. So for now we can say fill factor is checked in this diagram. However, we still see that as I was showing before, the IVOC was in the range of 740 millivolts. Now the VOC is somewhere in the 715. So we have a strong decrease in uh, VOC here. And we, yeah, we somehow try to find the reason for that. And um, the reason for the strong drop from IVOC to VOC we found is actually the ITO um, sputtering deposition. What you see here is a lifetime corrected PL image on the left side before sputtering, on the right side after sputtering. So you see we have this two by two square centimeter um, ITO patches which are sputtered through a mask. And in these areas where the ITO is sputtered, you clearly see this decrease of um, effective lifetime here down to approximately 700 microseconds, which really kills our VOC in the end. We also saw when we measure them on full size, um, that also the IVOC then clearly drops. So we thought, okay, this can maybe um, iron bombardment or UV damage. So we thought, okay, Let's try ALD since this is neither ion bombardment, ion bombardment nor UV damage. So we did the same. AZO was available. So we did AZO by ALD. And we see no degradation at all. I don't know if you can see it. You can see slightly these squares. Um, still some very low degradation. But this can be attributed to the ITO on the backside on the amorphous silicon, um, which also really slightly degrades. Um, and we can clearly attribute this because the front side looks like this. Uh, so this is what happens when you use ALD uh, with, a, with a mask. So the gases creep underneath the mask and form the layer also in between these uh, solar cell areas we designed. So you end up with another problem because now you have to disconnect these um, ITOs again or this AZO again by etching away. Um, yeah, so that was probably up to now also not the ideal idea. So um, we again thought, yeah, is it ion bombardment or UV damage? So we want to understand what's happening. Ion bombardment, we thought, yeah, since silicon carbide is a really hard material, also used for anti-scratch coatings for glasses and such, such things, um, we did a SRIM simulation to see how deep the ions can penetrate into the cell. And we found in just really few preliminary um, simulations that usually this, the ion energy should not be strong enough to penetrate to the, 
to the interface of silicon-silicon oxide to damage there. So we thought, okay, it might be UV damage. And um, we found this paper from our colleagues from the Netherlands and they showed that they found this um, oxygen plasma excitation mode at 9.5 EV, um, which is clearly responsible, which they can clearly attribute to the damage of their passivation. Uh, they had um, crystalline silicon with allox passivated, and they could clearly show that this um, oxidation, uh, this oxide mode, um, is the reason why their passivation decreased. So we thought, since we also have oxygen in our sputtering plasma, this might also happen for us. So the question was, um, can UV from this oxygen plasma decrease this transparent passivated contact passivation? So we did an experiment starting off with this wafer and putting three filters on top. Um, so the first one is a regular uh, glass filter, the second one is a quartz glass, and the third one is a magnesium fluoride filter. Um, these are the 50% transmission values of these filters. And so this oxygen mode would only be um, passed by the magnesium fluoride, by the round filter. So the others uh, would block this mode. And then we did 15 minutes of exposure to a pure oxygen plasma, and this is how it looked like in the end. So exactly how we assumed it to be. So the first two filters blocked this UV um, mode, and the third filter was um, passing it through, and we see a strong degradation only in, f in the area of filter 3 and in the uncovered area. So we could see that clearly this VUV, this vacuum UV mode could degrade our, um, our lifetime here. However, um, since this is not the real situation we have during sputtering, we did the same with a slightly smaller magnesium fluoride and thinner magnesium fluoride glass since they are expensive and now they get coated with ITO. So um, we did the same experiment with our ITO and our ITO sputter plasma only contains 3% of oxygen and 97% of argon. And we see that in this case, we don't see this degradation. So either the still small absorption of this filter decreases the intensity of this UV mode so much that we don't see any degradation, or just the intensity is not strong enough. So we can clearly see that UV degradation is indeed possible. However, um, we can't see it in our sputter degradation. And since also these glass filters block the um, ion bombardment, we would also don't see any influence of this ion bombardment here. So back to the drawing board, we thought, OK, maybe ion bombardment somehow is still playing uh, an important role for this degradation. And so we said, OK, um, then we test just other deposition methods and other TCO materials to see um, if we can improve on here. So we again did AZO by ALD, um, as I was showing before, and then etching back um, this uh, surplus AZO. And we did IWO by rapid plasma deposition, which uh, should have lower ion energies, um, so should be less harmful for the passivation when it's ion bombardment. We also tried ITIO because it was new in our institute and um, ITO we did by different sputtering systems and we tuned the parameters to somehow um, improve the, the outcome there. So we did this with a lot of partners and uh, when the samples came back we did this, this big overview. So the AZO showed um, no improvement in VOC, even though the PL image didn't show any degradation. Um, but it also showed a really, really strong drop in pseudofill factor. So actually, probably the shunt resistance is low, since the ASIO is creeping around the edge, probably. We are still studying this, and maybe for a full cell, without these uh, four cells on one wafer, this would work, but um, we're still figuring out what's the problem here. Maybe also this etching of this AZO harmed the passivation somehow. 
Um, this IWO by rapid plasma deposition showed um, also only, uh, so no improvement in, in VOC, even though the ion bombardment should be lower or the ion energy should be lower. However, this is also might be a future candidate since the JSC is the highest, so the material is the most transparent. And um, the ITIO also showed the strongest, uh, the, the lowest VOC, so the strongest decrease. Um, yeah, so this obviously also didn't work. And then this two ITO um, sample was surprisingly the best. Um, and the second ITO had slightly um, higher fill factor and higher JSC, so then we ended up here with the highest efficiency for this. So what we did for ITO2, we um, decreased the sputter power and increased the sputter pressure, so the mean free path is shorter, so the ion energy at the sample is lower, plus the sputter rate is lower, so the flux density is also lower. And um, what we found out here is actually that initially the IVOC or the VOC is slightly better than for the reference. This other one was the reference ITO. Um, but the, the big improvement is that we can now anneal these samples at 230 degrees C on a hot plate. So somehow um, before with this, this reference ITO, this um, passivation wasn't increasing at all, it wasn't responding to this. But this new ITO um, somehow enabled us to passivate it and uh, increase and heal and cure this damage by passivation. So um, in the end, um, we, this solar cell was um, certified by ISFH, so we sent it there and found 33.9% uh, uh, efficiency um, after increasing the fill factor by the double layer stack by you know, approximately some percent. Um, we now uh, achieved 10 millivolts more in VOC, which um, really improved the efficiency again. So we ended up saying, okay, this VOC now, it's not great. Th since we come still, we come from 740 to 735, which is the range of the, the solar cell precursors usually. However, for now, this is okay. And since my PhD is coming to an end, we really want to push for 24% uh, as a milestone at the end. So what do we do? The transparency is already high, but as I was showing in the beginning, we can tune the reflection. So we make a magnesium fluoride on top to decrease the reflection of the, the cell. So this is what we did, and this actually worked as we thought it should work. So in the short and in the long wavelength range, the reflection is decreased and the EQE is increased. And then we send it again to ISFH uh, to certification. And what happened was this. So now we ended up with 23.99%. <laughs> Uh, I calculated all values back and forth. It's still 23.99, so we couldn't help it. We were almost there, but not quite there. But yeah, at least we got 40.9 uh, milliamps per square centimeter in JSC, which is, to the best of our knowledge, uh, at least the highest value we found for um, front side passivated contact solar cells. So at least a mini milestone, <laughs> I would say. And maybe we can argue that this is somehow 24% because there is still a measurement error range. So um, I would like to summarize, coming back to this magic triangle, um, from the single layer to the double layer um, TPC, we could clearly achieve a higher uh, fill factor by improving then the ITO deposition. We clearly improved the um, VOC and by magnesium fluoride anti-reflection coating, we boosted the JSC. So we ended up with 23.99% uh, efficiency here. Um, yeah, to conclude, the choice of um, silicon oxide is critical for a high IVOC, probably also for um, contact resistivity. The fill factor can be improved um, by using a double layer stack of crystalline uh, microcrystalline silicon carbide and the VOC is mainly decreased by 
Sputter degradation, however, we still try to investigate what's now the root cause of this uh, degradation might be. Um, our contact doesn't need any high temperature processes, it uh, doesn't have any buried doped region we have to worry about, which doesn't need to be too shallow or too steep, and uh, we don't have any high additional hydrogenation step. So that's why we believe that uh, the silicon oxide, silicon carbide um, contact is a very versatile contact platform for all kinds of different silicon solar cells with different emitters um, on N-type silicon or probably we would like to test it also on P-type silicon as an emitter itself. Um, yeah, and we see what future brings for this contact. With this, I would like to say thanks for your attention and acknowledge um, my group, which did a great effort, and all the people contributing from our cooperation partners, not only to this ITO study, but to also to Oxide studies and yeah, all different kinds of stuff. Um, since not everybody could be here today, I included uh, the, my email address and the email address of my supervisor. So for any further questions you might have, um, please don't hesitate and contact us directly. And uh, we, hope to can we hope we can provide in the end uh, all the answers to your questions you may have. Thanks. You're welcome. Any questions? Okay, Brown. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the talk. A very impressive results. It's Thanks. close enough to 24%, yeah. I would say. Um, so what do you reckon is uh, the real efficiency potential of this contact? So what if we squeeze everything out? Uh, can we go to 25? Oh, we hope, of course, we hope. Um, I think for now the biggest potential is in the VOC. So we see this gap to IVOC, um, which is pretty pretty big right now. Um, we hope that we can somehow, uh, maybe with AZO, ALD, or any other deposition with ALD, or probably since this uh, Raptor Plasma deposition was also not tuned, so it was a was one shot we did, and um, maybe by optimizing this we might achieve. Higher, um, higher efficiencies there. I don't know. Um, probably also the backside contributes. So we also during the course of my PhD we gradually increase or ramped up our baseline. So also this contributed, of course, to the to the efficiency boost we see here, since also the backsides were improving throughout the time. So, yeah. Yeah, so did you calculate the, the selectivity according to the Brendel method for your optimized contact? Yes, I did. And I hope I put it here. I think I put it here. Yeah. So actually, I this is the pipes paper. You probably also know. Yeah. And um, so this is basically uh, the values from, from Robbie Pipes. With, he plotted with our... Um, with our uh, selectivities inside. So the highest selectivity, which was never ever been reached again, was uh, by, by Gunn and Swanson. Um, but in recent years, the, the best things uh, were done by Robbie Pipes um, in the lower part, and we are pretty, pretty close, so in the range of uh, 14. And these are results on test samples, I assume, so not what you have eventually in your device. Now, this, these are th this is the result from uh, IVOC and uh, contact resistivity on symmetric yeah, samples. I mean. so yeah, yeah. Test samples? Or yeah. Final yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, we have no uh, J naught values, or we, we tend to use the J naught values from this. Um, from the test yeah, from the test samples yeah. for this. So maybe I will ask, first on the measurement result, what is the uncertainty? Because 099, I assume that there is also uncertainty with the uncertainty of this measure. 0.5, I think, in efficiency. Is, I think it's 0 0.53 plus minus. Yeah. So, so fair enough. Positive. Yeah, it's not 0 0.001. Okay. <laughs> no, it's true. And I think that you had like the two systems in the like for the ITO. 
uh, is it, and the, re the result was quite good, is it the difference between them to your first result was because of the system or the parameters? Because you, after that, explain that with different parameters. If you take these parameters to your initial system, will the result will change? Is it something about design of the system or just the different parameters that you use? Um, actually, the, the, the IT01 was done in another, uh, at a corporation partner, so we don't know exactly um, w so what the design, so our system is different, how our system is different in design, but for to our improved ITO, this is the same system, so that was happening on the same system, just by tuning these parameters. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, I, the ITO result was with double layer yeah, as well? Yeah, exactly, that was the, the stage after, so yeah. then we took the double layer stack and optimized the ITO on top. Yeah. Uh, maybe a follow-up question on that. Do you have OES, so optical and spread cross? No, <laughs> we don't. Yeah. Otherwise, I wouldn't have shown a diagram of emission from from literature, That's but rather one of our our, our own system. Um, yeah, we actually don't have that. So yeah, that's that would be so interesting to yeah. know what what's happening there. Yeah, so I think that would be a cool one. Because also um, maybe coming back to the core technology, so you use Hotwire CVD, which yeah. um, I'm not sure if anybody's using. Uh, yeah, probably uh, Panasonic was using it for manufacturing. But yeah. uh, do you think the results will be different if we use PCVD for the silicon carbide? Actually, it would be probably. So the PhD of Manuel Pomasca um, was dedicated to finding the best silicon carbide for a proper for a good application to silicon solar cells. So we was doing heaps of material studies. Also comparing PCVD and um, micro, uh, um, hot wire CVD, and we found that the uh, uh, hot wire CVD is performing way better than the, um, the, the PCVD samples. And do you have any idea why? Yeah, I... Because of the softness of the... Yeah, I think also the crystallite size was, a, was an issue there, but I... I don't recall. I can I can look it up and give you the. Yeah, I think there. Um, so, uh, so the Santa Barbara group did some work in the early 2000s, looking at uh, how the hydrogen flux actually changes the material. Mm. So if you have a very high hydrogen flux during, in this case, a more silicon deposition, it really it changes the crystal crystal yeah. uh, size of a more silicon, and a similar thing could be happening yeah. there because the hydrogen is constantly etching but also diffusing and changing, basically reorganizing yeah. all the atoms. Mm. So yeah. that could be, could yeah. be part yeah. of the explanation. Yeah, and we also think that this is uh, part of the explanation there. Um, yeah, this also this hydrogen etching is, is affecting a lot of things. So it's affecting not only the interface or the silicon oxide or the, the, the silicon crystalline silicon surface, but obviously also the, the, the material itself. So also when we tune other parameters, then the, um, the filament temperature, we also... So you don't have OES as well in your hot wire system? No. We actually, right now, I don't know, probably things are stopped right now, but we're building a larger system so we can uh, fabricate full M4 wafers with hot wire CVD. So um, I, don't, I, I don't think that there's an OES inside yet, but maybe we, we can, we have a window where we can then Pluck it in the end. Uh, Good, they're not that expensive. So maybe one, one thing that I miss, all the result is on which type of wafers? Is it uh, it's CZ or FZ? It's uh, CZ. CZ uh, N type, one ohm square centimeter, uh, one ohm centimeter, uh, one, one, one zero zero, random pyramid etched, you know, standard. Other questions? If not, let's thanks again. Thank you very much, Malte. Yeah, thanks for the invitation.